how's everybody doing today? I'm your host, Rich, here on behalf of Rich TV Live with our very special guest, the CEO of Fiore Cannabis, Eric Anderson. How are you doing today, Eric? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Excited to have you on the show today. And I wanted to start off by asking you a little bit about your background and what made you want to become the CEO of Fiore Cannabis. Yeah, so I... Um... I was involved in the Canadian cannabis business as an investor first back in around 2013. And we didn't really know that it was going to go fully adult rec legal across the nation, but the medical program was great. I got to meet a lot of great people, got to re really meet a lot of the, uh, the companies in their pre IPO stage. And then sort of when everybody went public and uh, benefited from, you know, taking uh, a couple of private companies through the ACMPR licensing process to become a licensed producer in Canada. Uh, worked with a couple of, uh, you know, early stage retailers. And, you know, I really saw in 2018 that the run, the bull run on the markets had kind of got to this fever pitch where as the fundamental business uh, and, and financial numbers were about to be disclosed, and this is for the big guys and the little guys, but I just didn't think that those valuations were gonna were gonna kind of uh, be able to justify some of the, the wild market caps that we saw there in 2018, 2019. So for a brief period of time, I exited the, the, the business and really didn't have any designs on coming back until I was introduced to this company by a couple of major shareholders. And the more I got to kind of understand what they were doing, um, you know, I, I, I immediately jumped on a plane. I immediately went down to Las Vegas to look at the cultivation and production facility there. I immediately went over to Palm Springs to look at the retail dispensary there. And then I looked at the, um, the property that we had in Washington, which I, I've since divested. And then I looked at the Canadian assets as well, too. So uh, we're very close to, to divesting all of the Canadian assets and just focusing on the Las Vegas market and the Palm Springs Coachella Valley market. So the reason that I really wanted to do this is I, I fundamentally believed that the U.S. is marching towards, if not full legalization, but certainly decriminalization. And with the Biden-Harris win in November, I think that what we're seeing on the markets right now is, is a common belief in the U.S. that it's going to go legal States are continuing to go legal. There was another four who went adult rec uh, at the election time. There was a, another state that went medical. Uh, you know, Utah prior to that had gone medical. And then you see, uh, you know, with uh, Virginia recently, with New York and Connecticut and uh, Pennsylvania and a few of those other sort of those neat northeastern states kind of looks like they're going to come online here in, uh, in, in 2021. So I don't think it's a matter of if uh, the U.S. is going to go legal. I think it's a matter of when. And as the MORE Act and the States Act and the Safe Banking Act and, you know, the post-COVID stimulus, as that involves some, you know, some cannabis uh, tax revenue and, and other types of, uh, you know, ancillary revenues, I think that it's going to be a matter of time that, you know, this is going to be fully open. And we're going to see exactly what happened in Canada on the bull run. And I, it's the U.S., so they're going to probably do it way bigger and way better. And that's that's sort of what, what the U.S., uh, you know, what Americans do, right? So I'm really happy to be a U.S. multi-state operator. Um, I kind of had to be convinced to take the job. And then when I went and had a look for myself as to what the uh, what the assets and the operations look like, I, I was super happy to take on the, the role. And I think we've pretty much completed our turnaround uh, throughout 2020 and, and heading into 2021. we got a ton of momentum. Yeah, and the stock is doing really well today. Congratulations on that. What are your main focuses for Fiora Cannabis for the first half of 2021? So we said that by turning the company around, so we divested Washington, we're in the process of divesting Canada. We put a lot of money into Las Vegas and we put a lot of money and, and some supply chain uh, optimization into Palm Springs. Uh, we said we were going to be profitable and I'm happy to report. We actually just news released it today that, uh, you know, our first month of, uh, 2021, January, we turned a profit. We've, wow. got, uh, we've got, yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's been a lot of hard work and I, I really got to point to our team. Basically everybody at the company now is new. And that goes from our CFO, Kevin Cornish, who came on around the same time that I did. Uh, we basically brought on a completely new grow team out of Nevada. I had told our recruiter, I want the best and only the best. And I think we found the, the team that's just working so, so great down there. We, we grow our inorganic living soil and there's, there's different methodologies and, and protocols associated with that. 
We still have our Canadian guys out of BC who are acting as kind of consultants and, and advisors for those protocols. These are people who have been growing for generations in the, in the BC interior. So yeah, we, we said that we think we can clean up the balance sheet. We think that we can make the company profitable and I'm happy to report we're off to a great, great start. We're, we're one for one in terms of the months of the year and uh, already have some great momentum with the crops coming down here in, uh, in uh, February. And in, interesting to note that the, the first two, tr two crops that came off in January, again, organic, living soil, high THC, which is very important in the Las Vegas market, that those menus weren't on the street for more than about a day. And, and we had dispensaries saying that they take the whole lot. So we're hoping that we can almost advance sell our crops going down. And it all comes down to those, those test results, which basically proves that we've got a high yield operation and we've got a high THC operation. Well, right now the cannabis sector is on fire. It seems like all cannabis stocks, Canada and the United States are on fire right now. Yeah. So what separates Fiori Cannabis from all the rest of the companies that are out there? That's a great question. Um, I think business fundamentals is again, I, I just want to have a really clean balance sheet, low debt profile. I want to be able to show that, you know, we're a publicly traded company. So we're going to have to, to show profitability or at least a path to profitability. Uh, there's some, you know, one of the things about, you know, further, uh, I guess, legislative relaxation uh, in the U.S., you know, if we can get to a more act, if we can get to a safe banking act, we won't have uh, things like 280E standing in front of us to, to really sort of crush our, our, our bottom line profitability. But I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I've run tech businesses before. I've run businesses in oil and gas. I've run uh, cannabis businesses in, in Canada. And I just come back to the basics of, uh, and, and the fundamentals of business, which is, you know, have a, have a very low debt profile, um, have, a, have a clean balance sheet, be able to demonstrate that you can have positive cash flow and that you can have profitability and then scale it from there. Any type of scaling that we're going to be able to do, you know, we sit on seven acres of land in Las Vegas and we've got 10,000 square feet built out, but I've got uh, engineering uh, drawings and I've got sort of a plan to get us to about 80,000 square feet this year. And I've got a lot of people knocking on our door saying, hey, we'd like to finance that. And, and non-dilutively as well too, just you know, maybe some debt financing or some convertible financing or just some JV financing, because I think that we can turn that, that's, that's roughly about a $10 million a year uh, revenue potential in Las Vegas at the cultivation and production facility. We could easily make that a 60 to $70 million uh, proposition by just expanding it. And that's called profitable growth, right? So the fundamentals that, that myself and the team have brought in, it's just kind of getting back to basics, a little bit less on the kind of pump and dump sort of schemes that you know we've kind of seen out there, learned a lot from the Canadian experience. It was a great learning experience, but again, when I was involved with private companies and then advising some, some publicly traded companies, I would always be the guy in the room saying, hey, don't we got to get to profitability? Don't we got to get to fundamentals? And, and, and we're hoping that that will behoove us in our sort of our strategy going forward. And like I said, we're already, already off to a great start here in 2021. So let's talk about that. So you mentioned that you are profitable already in your first month of 2021. And that is something to be very excited about. How do you plan to maintain that throughout the year? And what are your plans and what are your projections for the rest of 2021? Great question. So really for us, um, what we were able to do, I'll talk about the dispensary in, in uh, Coachella Valley for a minute there, is that it had the potential very early in, uh, upon my arrival to make money. And where it wasn't making money was on the supply chain. So we really needed to get back to those vendor relationships get better terms, more, you know, just that kind of bulk buying and let's get some payment terms rather than cash for everything, you know, and, and you know, we, we, we put some banking in place uh, in both of our operations. We've got point of sale, we've got an ATM machine for cash. We're now dabbling into delivery. And so we've actually taken that, we've increased the revenues from about April of last year, 22%. And so we've increased the revenues, but we've also optimized sort of the, the, the back office so that we're even more profitable. So that uh, heading into around the Christmas period of time, we started making money on that store on a month over month basis. And so we're happy to report that sales are still strong, even though tourism's weak uh, in the Palm Springs area. And we've put some marketing initiatives, in, which will include a new website, e-commerce, delivery, 
And when that tourism industry picks back up, whether you're at a wellness spa or a resort or Airbnb or wherever it is, you can just dial us up because we're, you know, we're actively marketing with billboards and other types of promotional stuff in the Valley there. And uh, you can order it right up online and we'll deliver it right to your, uh, your resort room door kind of thing. Right. So that was the first change that we were able to enact. Uh, going forward in, in uh, back to Las Vegas with cultivation and production, we've now got the harvest schedule set up for the year. And we'll do somewhere around 30 to 34 harvests uh, out of our facility there, 10,000 square feet. Every successive harvest, because we are using organic living soil. So that's the type of soil you don't have to throw out at the end of the harvest, right? Every time you reuse it, you're putting in nutrition, nutritional amendments, you're basically stimulating the soil to be truly a living soil. You know, we've got earthworms in there. We've got uh, crickets and all kinds of other crazy stuff that it's, it's truly an organic product and that the soil gets better over time. So every successive crop, we're going to see higher yield. We're going to see higher THC percentages, which is huge for the retail market in, in Las Vegas. And the soil is just going to get better and better over time. So we're forecasting every time I look at a harvest going out to March, April, May, we're getting, we're squeezing some more harvests in and uh, we're actually making each crop more profitable on a crop over crop harvesting basis. So that's really where we're focused right now. Our grow team is exceptional. They have uh, a great reputation in the market. Our head grower, um, I don't have to go in and uh, sell his skill set to the dispensaries in Las Vegas. I just mentioned that he's on our team. And typically we will sell crops before they even hit the market just because he's a known master grower and we're growing organically. And that's a huge differentiator in that market. That's perfect. You were mentioning some of your members. Can we talk a little bit about that? What separates your members and your team from other teams out there? What makes your members so special? And what are the key members of your team that you want to let the people that are watching all over the world know about? That's great. I love talking about our people. So right around the time that I was asked to, first thing was to, that they wanted me to join the board. And then it looked like, you know, we had a little bit of a change that they wanted to make. So they asked me to be CEO. So I actually helped them hire a CFO and his name's Kevin Cornish. He's a younger guy. He comes from the Canadian cannabis retail uh, sort of background. Uh, he was with High Tide. And, you know, just a young, energetic guy. And I think that passion in this business, understanding, understanding the cultural significance of this business, it's not just a suit and tie thing for investors or for the banking world. It's, it's understanding the culture and he does, right? So what he brings to the table is a high level of energy. You know, in COVID, we, we joke around a lot, but we're, we're working 16 hour days and sometimes the days just merge into the next day. And it's almost like we, we you know, we went to a home-based scenario because of the pandemic and our, and our productivity has never been higher. In, in 28 years of my career, I've never been more productive than I have than, than during this pandemic. And thankfully we've been able to travel a little bit. We have got down to our operations, but you know, Kevin's a key member of the team, just again, young, energetic, very passionate about the space. You know, when I think about our grow team, you know, Hassan, our master grower, he comes into this with a great deal of experience. He's worked in the industry in Colorado, in Michigan, in uh, Montana, in the Northeast as well too. He's, he's worked for the big guys like Acresco. And, and now he's working for a company of our size where, you know, there was no secret. We had to reboot everything in this business. So we had sort of stumbled along earlier last year with just maybe some growers who weren't up to our standards, right? We were going for a, a grade A plus standard. So when we found him, he was able to start bringing his team in slowly. And now we're up to a grow team of five in, in, the, uh, in the cultivation and production facility. We've got an excellent uh, uh, compliance uh, regulatory uh, person. We've got some great help when it comes to the packaging and the trim team. And it's really this sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a 10,000 square foot facility, but I always said this back to the Canadian days. If you were able to scale in increments of 10,000 square feet, you would be successful because one of the things that the big, big, big guys, when they were building their indoor football field stadiums were, you know, these, these huge indoor, whether it was a, a, a greenhouse or just a massive indoor grow, they all sort of assume that it's weed, right? It's just going to grow. We're going to grow the most of it. It's going to be the best in the history of the world. And, you know, we're not going to have any problems there. And then the crop failures start coming. 
then the, oh my gosh, infestation and, you know, powdery mildew, mold, mites, all that kind of stuff. If you're an open canopy and you've got one master grower for say 500,000 square feet, it's a difficult, it's a difficult job. And, you know, you've got a lot of master growers that come out of that, I'll call it that gray market over the decades. They grew fantastic crops, high yielders, high testers with 20 lights. Well, scaling from 20 lights to 2000 lights is not an easy job. No. So, so what we're doing in Las Vegas is that when we modular, we're going to build out our, our facility there in modular chunks of 10,000 square feet. And for every one of those, I'm going to have a master grower because it's just my philosophy. I've just seen it in action. A lot of where the Canadian market started to do this when they were reporting their, their financials is that it was crop failure and it was really crops that weren't worthy of the retail you know everybody thought it might be an a grade but was really a d minus grade kind of thing right and the other thing too that you know a lot of people don't talk about is just access to genetics so the good news about nevada and our grow team that hassan has kind of led up is that we were able to do a review of our genetic library ourselves and then through the medical system you're also able to bring new genetics in and I, I often likened, uh, I don't want to beat up too much on Canada because I'm a Canadian and, 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 and I, you know, I love being a Canadian, but um, when you were buying legal cannabis in stores in 2018, 2019, even up until now, it's a lot of Coors Light, Bud Light, Michelob Light. It's not the heavy hitter genetic strains that you would find safe, for instance, in the gray market. So that's one of the big things that we were able to do as well, too, is people first, I think you're always going to need the best people. And then looking at your facility, you've got to upgrade it. We upgraded to LED lights. We upgraded to a better water RO system. We've put UV lights into all of our HVACs. We, air purification is super important to us. We don't want to have crop failures and we don't want to have infestations and, and other types of, uh, you know, things that, that can really take down a crop. So, and then it comes to your genetics, right? And you've got to be growing the best. And for us, we've got a genetic library now of over 50 strains. And we're trying to cherry pick which are the ones that yield best, which are the ones that's, that, uh, that test best. And, and, and really for us, it's that 25% THC and higher. We can get it up to the, you know, 32, 33 uh, on our flower. Our flower is known as a top shelf flower in the Las Vegas market. And that's probably a real testament to our, our grow team and, and our organic platform. And really at the end of the day, the market's going to tell you how you're going to do. And, you know, if you're building brands and, you know, all these buzzwords that you hear in the industry, well, you can go build a brand and it's got the greatest packaging in the history of, of the cannabis industry. It's got the greatest marketing and promo. But at the end of the day, if you sell that into the market and it's a connoisseur market and you start getting bad reviews, the brand is dead right out of the gate. So there's all these elements that we're working on, but it all starts with people. It starts with the facility, the genetics, and just making sure that you do what you say you're going to do. That's great. Now for us, our community is all over the world. I believe we've got about a hundred countries watching Rich TV Live now, and we love to help put companies on the map like yourself. Now it's vital that we understand your share structure. Yeah. We love tight float stocks. One yeah. of the issues that we've seen with cannabis stocks, not all of them, some of them, very dilutive because they were literally printing shares to keep the lights on, printing shares to not go bankrupt. Um, in a lot of cases, and some of them have turned it around. Some of them have found their way through it. Some of them have not. What is your share structure? How much is held by insiders and institutions? Because we love tight float stocks. Well, I'm super glad you asked because when I took the job around a year ago, we had 156 million shares issued and outstanding. And there were a lot of warrants that um, have since expired. They, they just didn't make, uh, didn't make the mark. Um, I reversed a transaction that my predecessors had done, whereby I took back into Treasury 18.5 million shares. So I have re reverse diluted the company. We sit at around 134 million shares issued and outstanding today. 84% of those, we know where they are. Um, and, right. and really, when I talk about a cleanup, 2020 was the year of the cleanup. So not, not only did we improve the facilities and get the dispensary more profitable, but we went back into the share structure and we probably crossed out around 20 to 25 million shares. So just right. by identifying who those potential shareholders were that wanted to, uh, wanted to exit the business, uh, we made crosses. So if you saw any volume spikes in, in 2020, that was pretty much a cross that we were taking from 
what I would call unknown hands into friendly hands. And so we're, we're held at about 84% of our uh, issued and outstanding is in friendly hands. Wow. Um, we've sort of broken it down by brokerage house and that's a yeah. lot. <laughs> that's yeah. a lot in friendly hands. That's pretty good. Yeah. So, so what we, you know, people say, well, what's your public float then? And, you know, it's probably somewhere still around 20 million shares, maybe 25, but That's very, as, very as we've been, you know, we believe in this business, our management team board and, you know, some of our close, you know, long-term shareholders, they've understood that this was a turnaround project. We're pretty much on the precipice of announcing for once and for all that this is turned around and we're off to profitability. And we've been accumulating shares along the way. I put a lot of my own personal money into the business, um, both in the form of buying shares and I've you know, loaned the business some money just as we did that turnaround. Um, I, at one point in my career, had a very um, fledgling upstart tech company and it was private, had a couple of partners in that business. And I always remember our advisor telling us like, you're going to sell this business someday. So your private company, treat it like it's a publicly traded company. So when we sold that business to, uh, to Trimble, uh, you know, $6 billion market cap, and they sit their lawyers and accountants on you for di due diligence. Well, we passed with flying colors. And it was an all cash deal. Now that I'm the CEO of a publicly traded company, I'm sort of reversing that. I'm saying, treat it kind of like a like private company for a little bit here, right? I understand I've got to talk to shareholders. We're, you know, we've made probably over 40 news releases since my arrival 12 months ago, just to keep the news out there. Just I've done CEO forums. I've done Zoom meetings with shareholders because it's important that everybody understand what the message is and everything that we said we were going to do, we've done. So now that we looked at the capitalization tables, we headed into the new year. Again, we would love to have new shareholders coming on board that really buy into the long-term strategy here. I think the U.S. space is still going to just explode. We want to be one of the primary players in that space. You know, if you look at the, the board game Monopoly in the, in the U.S. cannabis space, I think having Las Vegas and Palm Springs are two awesome pieces of the board and we're profitable in both. And then, you know, some people talk to me about, you know, options and warrants and, you know, is there a bunch that are going to come on the market and dilute the shares? Well, I can tell you this, all the warrants are from our new investors. And, you know, for instance, I, I never brought friends and family into any deals before. And I've probably bought, brought about 40 to 50 of my, you know, the people that wanted to kind of come along from the ride. So um, a few of our other large shareholders, they're bringing people in. Every time that we know people who are buying shares, we just think that that we're just really tightening our hold on, on the uh, on the share structure. And then any warrants that are going to come due are going to come from these friendly investors. And they know that this is a long term buy and hold for a period of time here. And then our options are all management. So that was just, you know, that we're incentivizing our people uh, by way of options and, and helping grow the company, make it profitable and really expand ourselves. Like we can begin our expansion um, on, uh, we've got an extra license, uh, an extra cultivation license in Las Vegas. We've got that out on the market. It's worth a couple million bucks. So that money would go, we'll sell that license and we'll immediately put it into the expansion of our Apex facility in Las Vegas non-dilutive, no debt. We're actually organically growing as well as not just, you know, producing a high product and getting good margin for it. And then, yeah, am I going to have to raise some money? Probably. But, you know, now that the share price has sort of been stabilized, you're going to start to see, especially with, you know, more market awareness out there. I've always said I I'd like to be in 2021 the best kept secret in the U.S. MSO space. You know, we're kind of a little guy right now. But I think we can beef ourselves up. You know, we're also in discussions to potentially buy a dispensary in Las Vegas. By the time we expand our footprint in Las Vegas to, like I say, 80 to 100,000 square feet, um, get that retail dispensary. I think that's a $100 million business. And then over the border in California, we've got a very profitable uh, store right now. We're going to put some additional marketing behind it. But we also own two and a half acres of land that's literally a five minute drive away. And we've got some designs to build out a cultivation there too. So our goal, vertically integrated in Las Vegas, vertically integrated in Palm Springs, and everything that we do is going to either be profitable from the get-go or have an automatic ROI in terms of raising capital. If there was one thing you would want shareholders to know or potential investors that are watching this video about Fiora Cannabis, what would it be? That we're a fundamentally sound business that we, um, 
we've really tightened our operating expenses. So as we climb revenues, we're not adding more and more people or more and more equipment, supplies, whatever it is. We're going to run it profitable from here on out. And we're going to do everything for, for shareholder value that we can, right? And that includes great communication. And every time that we've got opportunities to maybe expand our footprint, we are looking at some M&A opportunities, not just retail, but we're looking at some other potential synergistic acquisitions in the Nevada market. Um, just being super transparent with our, with our shareholder and investor base. And being like, I'd, I'd love to just be known as that unicorn in the US MSO space that we not, might not be the biggest, but we're building a platform here that we can bring in some accretive M&A opportunities. And then, you know, sort of to what I saw in the Canadian space, probably one of the big guys is going to knock on your door at some point in time. And they're going to do that due diligence and they're going to look for some chinks in the armor. And there aren't going to be any because it's a fundamentally sound business. So. There's going to be shareholders all over the world. They're going to want to get in contact with you that uh, potentially business partners, like you're talking about mergers and acquisitions, a lot of other public companies watch these videos that might be watching and learning about your company. What's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Uh, yeah. So we just sort of did uh, a, a new uh, launch of our website. So the best thing would be to go to the investor section of our website, sign up for our newsletter. It kind of gets you into the database. Uh, we've been doing some mail outs recently because we put a uh, telegram uh, app together where people can kind of have some discussion relative to our company. We put a YouTube channel together. Uh, we're sort of stepping up our game on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just on that social media aspect. And yeah, so it, it all starts with just uh, putting your name into the database or uh, trying to find us on one of the various social media or business media outlets. We don't intend to kind of shy away at this, at this stage right now. Uh, you know, we did the name change back in November. Um, I think we've doubled our share price since that name change. That name change was really from the Nevada market where, you know, the, uh, the, the brand is, is, is synonymous with, uh, you know, high quality flour. It, it's Italian for flour. We like the name. It really represents who we are. Um, it, it, it instantly sells when, when those menus hit the, uh, hit the Las Vegas market. So we think that by the time that we were almost ready to say, hey, the turnaround's complete, we did the name change, we did the branding change, new website, all these other channels. Um, we enjoy talking to shareholders. And the fun part is, is taking somebody who's maybe been a long-term shareholder and really changing their mind that this is actually going to return an investment to them, right? It's not just a get your money back scenario anymore. It's you're going to actually make some money here. And then for our new investors coming in, they're coming in fresh and it's just really important to us, whatever we communicate to the market, if we say we're going to do it, we're going to do it. I'm really impressed with everything I hear. Eric Anderson, the CEO of Fiore Cannabis. Remember, Rich TV Live is strictly for education and entertainment purposes. Always do your due diligence, always do your research, and consult a financial advisor before you make any investment in any companies that we talk about on our show. Chances are, if you speak to a financial advisor, they're going to do their due diligence and they're going to say, yeah, looks like a little, really, really, really good deal. Um, I really like what I see here, Eric. I think this is a company that is undervalued, underappreciated, underexposed. Before today, I didn't know about Fiora Cannabis. So this is something that is really going to, I think, become way more mainstream. Um, I think way more investors and members of our community are going to be learning about this company, researching this company, getting a better feel for the company. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of them also position themselves in the company. Early stage, price right, starting to build momentum, like you said, you're lowering the share structure, 84%, like you mentioned, held by friends and people that you're comfortable with, institutions, friendly hands. And you mentioned like a 20 million float. That is extremely tight float. So we, we look for that here at Rich TV Live. So thank you for doing the business the right way and building a strong company. We're not concerned about having the biggest company. We're concerned about finding the best company at the lowest prices and seems as though this is a company that is on the rise. If you guys like the video, please smash the like button, comment down below, share the video everywhere and subscribe. Eric Anderson, the CEO. Thank you for joining us today, Eric. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure.
And thank you guys for watching. If you're not winning, you're not watching. This is Rich from Rich to be Live with Eric Anderson, the CEO of Fiore Cannabis, saying have a nice day and we'll talk to you soon.